Hello and good afternoon from Frankfurt. I am Martina Weinhardt, curator here at the Schimpfunsthalle and um, together with, with Georgiana Uyarek from the AGO in Toronto, uh, I organized the Magnetic North, North exhibition uh, around the landscape painting of the famous, in Canada famous group of seven in Germany, not yet so famous. Uh, in our series of impulse lectures around this exhibition, I'm very happy to welcome my esteemed colleague from Toronto, um, Wanda Nanibush. Hi, Wanda, welcome in our um, virtual space that we are sharing these days. Um, Wanda uh, is Anishna Brikwe from Beausoleil uh, First Nation. And uh, together with Georgiana, she's uh, head of the Indigenous and Canadian Art Department at the Art uh, Gallery of Ontario in Toronto uh, since uh, 2017, when this whole department was uh, restructured from Canadian Art Department to Indigenous and Canadian Department. I'm sure we hear we also hear about that in your lecture. I'm very curious about the restructuring you did. Uh, of course, I know a lot about that already from visiting, but I'm sure our, um, our visitors uh, will be very curious as well to learn how indigenous art is integrated in the world of the museum that um, is uh, of course from another cultural background. So this is very, um, very interesting discussion that is still ongoing. And Wanda has worked a lot uh, as an activist, I can say, or I may say um, in this um, section, Wanda has also published widely on indigenous art, politics, history, feminism, and sexuality. So she is a woman of many talents. And um, yeah, I'm very curious to hear about your thoughts and I'll leave you uh, the floor. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here with us, Wanda. Thank you, Martina. I, um, I'm very happy to be here too. And I'm really happy to wish I could see everyone that might be tuning in with us this morning. I guess it's afternoon for you guys, but it's morning for me. Um, it's a pretty hard time. Um, I'm Wanda Nanabush, Anishinaabe Kwe from Bosle First Nation. I'm Wolf Clan, and we come from this little island in Georgian Bay, and we call it the Caribbean of the North. It's quite beautiful. I'm hoping uh, today that uh, we can walk through, you know, some of Indigenous art history in relation to museums, but also I want to introduce you to some artists, some artworks, and kind of the activism artists have been engaged in inside the museums. And then uh, we will reserve some time at the end for questions. So please uh, send in questions. So I have something to answer at the end. Um, but I'm very happy to be here. I am going to uh, just start my uh, screen share so that I can start my talk. Wow, this is loading, my computer's slow today. Uh, indigenous art is a very conflicted, diverse and rich field that has fought hard to have a place within art institutions and museums in the world. As someone who did not grow up in museums, I still find I struggle to belong in them today. What makes me feel most at home is seeing work by First Nations artists from the hundreds of nations that make up the category of indigenous. 
I need contemporary indigenous art to feed my soul, to feed my thinking on where we have been, where we are going. The work makes me feel alive, transformative, engaged in the here and now. It is from this space of engaging contemporary artists that gives me my strategies and commitments. Contemporary means working from now, but with an eye to the past and the future that are present in the now. When we rewrite our histories, we actively create the futures attached to those histories that never came to be. These alternative futures are about creating a world where First Nations can exist and thrive on their own terms. Indigenous art is now a stated focus for collecting and exhibiting at the AGO, which is the museum that I work for in Toronto, Canada. It's um, one of the top three uh, museums in the country and it's backed up by my new position as the curator of this field. Um, in renaming our department, Indigenous and Canadian, you'll notice that Indigenous is first. And this is something that we, um, uh, something that many people didn't quite notice and it took a while for people to say it because they always wanted to say Canadian and Indigenous. So it took a bit and that tells you a little bit about where we're at um, in terms of not acknowledging and not understanding um, that indig Indigenous people were here first. This is their land, our land. And, um, and we are in a process, I think the museum can be a place where we can teach about these histories and we can learn about these histories and we can learn about each other um, such that we can do what Georgiana and I are doing, which is thinking about ourselves in a nation to nation relationship. So equal, but separate in this together, but may have very different laws, very different ways of being, and very different kind of philosophies on how to operate. And also I think very different ideas of what art is. For me, it has no, uh, indigenous art is any art made by an indigenous person. For me, it has no set aesthetics or look, no set content or story it must tell and no set materials that it must use. It's important to walk through this history of representation in museums through indigenous artworks and the actions of indigenous artists who really have been at the forefront of change. This path is not linear or a natural progression, rather it's many hauntings, explosions, fault lines and transformations. I cannot be exhaustive today, but we're just gonna open a few little treasures. Um, as, as a beginning, you'll notice the slide that's, that you're looking at is Indians of Canada Pavilion, 1967. And I will talk about this in a minute. It is one of the kind of first moments of contemporary indigenous art kind of going on a world stage and a national stage. Um, but you can see the language here, Indians. And as a beginning, I thought it might be hap helpful to map um, the language shifts in how we have been named. We no longer use the word Indian because it's a misnomer that erases our subjectivity, our nationhood and diversity, as well as being tied to uh, racist legislation in Canada, which is called the Indian Act. The one exception is those of us, and I'm one of these people, <laughs> who use it amongst ourselves uh, to describe the experience of assimilation policies, reservation life, racism, the solidarity that comes when you meet others who've been through it too. So we often use Indian in this way. And many of our old folks will say, you know, we'll, we'll call our languages, oh, speaking Indian. Um, and it just comes from our, our experience of that time period. Native became, and to a large extent, is still popular since the 60s. It had to be capitalized to distinguish first peoples from any native who was born in a place. Peoples was added to native to account for the diversity of nations the word contained. And in Canada, we have like over 600 First Nations. Um, Aboriginal peoples also became used um, much more in relation to the Canadian Constitution of 1982, which has section 35, which states that Aboriginal and treaty rights are hereby recognized and affirmed. Aboriginal peoples includes First Nations, Inuit and Métis. Aboriginal is not widely liked by indigenous people, 
due to the meaning of ab, ab, meaning not, which then means not original. It's also a word imposed and not chosen, like the word Indian. First Nations became a word that marked both our nationhood and firstness on this land now called Canada. Eventually it was used for specific reservation bounded bands, which meant it no longer could be used for all first peoples, including Inuit and Métis. I still use it for all first peoples because the first time that First Nations was used, it was, it was meant for everyone. It just got politicized in a certain way. First Nations is also starting to become common in the USA and Australia. Indigenous has been used since the 70s for international First Peoples. Uh, indigenous cites the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples and implies global connection and rights, which is why my uh, title is Curator of Indigenous Arts. Some people like Indigenous because it speaks to a connection to the land. Indigenous comes from the Latin word indigena, indigena, if you're Spanish, <laughs> which means sprung from the land, native. Some First Nations in Australia don't like the name indigenous because it's too close to being labeled flora and fauna, which was how they were categorized under the law there. We only have to come up with general all encompassing terms for convenience of colonialism, which has lumped us all together as one when for millennia we were many nations with our own governance systems, belief systems, medicine, philosophies, science, education systems, and social structures with territories and ways of being. In general, each nation prefers its own name for itself in its own language. Mine is Anishinaabe. So Tom Hill, who's a Haudenosaunee artist and curator um, is one of the very first folks uh, to start working in Indigenous art and bringing it, this conversation to the wider public. Um, and he, he um, was one of the first curators of Indigenous art, curated some of the first exhibitions. He started a gallery on his, in his home, uh, Six Nations, just outside of Toronto. Um, and he talks about the Indians of Canada Pavilion at Expo, Expo 67 as an early flashpoint for indigenous art, almost like a major coming out party. He helped change the course of the pavilion um, from one of silencing native views to an in your face creative rendition of contemporary native politics. It was quite controversial at the time. There were a lot of participating artists um, some of them, including himself, um, the Hunts, who are from the West Coast, Carvers, Alex Janvier, Norval Morso, who I'll say more about, Carl Ray, Gerald Tailfeathers, um, and more. Again, the centennial celebration, so it was the 100th anniversary of Canada, drove the government's desire to tell a happy story where Native people's assimilation into Canada was a great success. This narrative also drove their choices of what artists and artworks that should be exhibited in the pavilion. George Manuel, who's a, who was an incredible uh, native leader, um, Shushwap, pushed for an open call so artists could, could bid for the commissions. He didn't want the government just choosing artists um, who could tell this happy story. In a response of refusal to bid for a generic totem pole that the officials wanted, the rising star, Bill Reed, who you might know, said, if you hire a Haida carver, you get a Haida pole. If you hire a Kwakul carver, you get a Kwakul pole. There are no Shimshin carvers. If you want a bastard pole, draw your own conclusions. So he was really kind of responding to this idea of specificity, knowing the nations, knowing the traditions, and not using some kind of generic idea of a totem pole. In 1987, and so we're jumping like 20 years. Um, this is artist James Luna, the late great artist James Luna. Um, and this is the work Ishi Speaks. I'll speak more about that in a second. I wanna speak to the artifact piece that he did in 1987. Um, he presented himself as a lifeless object, a body in a vitrine. 
Um, he was wearing a loincloth and he was placed inside the San Diego Museum of Man. And he laid there for hours over many days while people talked around him, touched him, he rarely moved. There were clues in the objects and labels in the exhibit that he was alive. Many, some people didn't know that and that he was a contemporary person. His divorce papers, his degree, sunglasses, some records were some of the things that disrupted the display of the primitive man. Luna told me the one thing he didn't expect to feel was anger. He had not thought about all the racist and colonial comments he would have to hear day in and day out while he was laying in the vitrine. His statement points to the personal cost and the emotional labor that goes into museum work for most First Nations. Luna said in an interview um, in the Smithsonian that the inspiration for the work was a critique of museum anthropology. Quote, I had long looked at representation of our peoples in museums and they all dwelled in the past. They were one-sided. We were simply objects among bones, among bones among objects, and then signed, sealed with a date. In that framework, you really couldn't talk about joy, intelligence, humor, or anything that I know that makes us, makes up our people. He passed away three years ago and he was a very good friend. Um, and we're hoping uh, to bring this work that you're looking at right now into the collection of the Art Gallery of Ontario. So James Luna is considered to be the grandfather of indigenous performance art. He said that performance art didn't compromise indigenous artists because performance orality is already an indigenous art form and because his contemporary body is present. So you can't, you can't pretend like he's just a figure of the past. In August, 1911, a starving Native American man walked out of Butte County wilderness into Oroville and became an instant journalistic success. He was identified by UC anthropologists, Alfred Krober and T.T. Waterman as the last of a remnant band of Yahi people native to the Deer Creek region. He was often talked about, and this is Ishii, the middle, the middle photograph in this work um, is an archival photograph of Ishii. Um, he was often talked about the last wild Indian. And um, this is the kind of narrative that was built around him. They gave him the name Ishi, which meant man in the Yahi language. During the next four years, the anthropologists and physicians at the University of California, Berkeley would learn much about Ishi as he demonstrated his tool making, hunting skills, and he spoke story, talks, told stories and sang songs. Um, in his writings, Waterman respectfully noted that Ishii's gentlemanliness, which lies outside of all training, is an expression of inward spirit. And the records of the time reveal mutual respect on the part of Ishii and his scientist observers. Um, and Ishii was actually not just a person on display, you know, a display of primitiveness, a display of wildness. Um, he was also a researcher and um, they hold his uh, papers and his uh, work at the university. But at the same time, there was no real public respect um, on part of the university or, 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 the, or the people um, for who this man was. They didn't treat him like a man. So that's where this piece is coming from, Ishii Speaks. So James Luna is kind of speaking in a way, if he, he was wondering what would, what would Ishii speak if he was standing in front of an audience that was kind of throwing all this kind of um, stereotypes of the primitive man at him. Um, so he's using humor as a way to undo those kinds of stereotypes, but also recuperate Ishii um, to bring him back into the present and as a kind of ancestor. The other part of the story that's never really told is that the reason Ishii was coming out um, into the city was because his people were undergoing forced relocation. Um, they were doing land burnings and uh, lots of land theft in his area um, and people were being murdered. And so it's a very colonial story in terms of why he was the so-called last man. This is a work, Sea Captain by the Haida artist once known, it's 1860s to 90s. 
And this is another kind of interplay between a public and indigenous art. So this is an Argelite work that would have been made kind of at the height of colonialism when all the ships are coming into the West Coast. And artists started making these works as kind of tourist, tourist type things so that they could sell them you know, to all the folks coming in. But it also is a representation of the Haida looking at the sea captains and the colonialists who are moving into their territory. Um, the AGO, the Art Gallery of Ontario, uh, hosted a conference uh, in 2002 called On Aboriginal Representation in the Gallery, where the weak inclusion of First Nations in Canadian art galleries was recognized and talked about. Anna Hudson was a curator at the Art Gallery of that in that time, non-Native person. And she wrote um, in the book that accompanied the conference that uh, all of the work, like what you're gonna see, the group of seven, Emily Carr, this kind of Canadian artists are kind of trading on indigenous primitiveness in their own work and indigenous artifacts, not like this one that you're looking at now, but what they would consider pure, untouched by colonialism, um, authentic. And here's a quote from Anna. Carr's images also record the stylistic relationship between she and her contemporaries, the group of seven, between the modern and the primitive. However, the reality of First Nations in Canada and the autonomy of Aboriginal cultures isn't discussed. The Aboriginal is absent, represented only by the ruins of a once thriving culture. Or in the case of the group of seven, they're just absent entirely from the landscape. Overall, authentic cultures were thought to have disappeared with the advent of contact. And the only place to experience real indigenous cultures were in these museums that had pretty much stolen, collected, bought, work during high colonialism times. The first collections of indigenous art were largely held by anthropological ethnographic collections within natural history museums or museums of man. The museums received these collections from individuals who traveled along imperial and colonial routes, studying, buying, confiscating, looting, grave robbing from indigenous people globally. These museums were dedicated to cultural and historical objects, now also include contemporary art. What began as an individually collected curiosity, collected into curiosity cabinets of cross-cultural and natural material became collections in newly bu built museums starting in the mid 1800s, which became the main way to reinforce racial hierarchy, feeding colonialism and imperialism. As new colonies became more entrenched and looked towards museum to build their own national identities, again, these collections became a way to explain away contemporary indigenous rights to land. In this context, knowledge of First Nations cultures were known through interpretations of collected and confiscated material by biologists, natural scientists, archeologists, surveyors, entrepreneurs, ethnographers, and anthropologists. Their interpretations did did not often benefit the community knowledge and did not often have the benefit of community knowledge and context, which meant they could reinforce colonial attitudes towards indigenous peoples, which often swung between stereotypes of noble and bloodthirsty savages, like between the, the good Indian, who's the noble one and the bad Indian, who's the bloodthirsty savage, I'm gonna kill you in your sleep. The knowledge of anthropologists and ethnographers benefited from community-based research, but still placed within an overall Western framework for categorizing, categorizing objects and people. Overall, authentic cultures were thought to have disappeared with the advent of contact. Academically, this is known as salvage ethnography, which names the way in which collectors and interpreters, curators, believed our cultures were dying out and they needed to save it for future generations to enjoy. In other words, how and why indigenous communities might make, interpret or use these belongings did not influence the overall collecting, interpreting or display policies of museums. The cultural genocide 
assimilation, and land confiscation policies that led to actual deaths were never examined as part of the collection story. The fact that Indigenous nations still existed and cultures continued to grow and change never entered the con conversation. And if it did, it was only to talk about how contact had contaminated the once pure peoples of nature. This you're looking at is a work by uh, Jeff Thomas. And it's part of a long conversation that Jeff has had. He's an Onondaga artist, also from the Haudenosaunee um, Confederacy. And he was looking for antecedents for his photography practice. And he couldn't find any early indigenous photographers. There are some, but at the time he couldn't find them. Um, and so he was looking at how, what is the photography that people see as indigenous? And of course, Edward S. Curtis, which is the, the middle, uh, middle part of this triptych um, was what came to mind. And so he did a long, long, years long engagement with Edward S. Curtis photographs. And he, when he looks at this photograph, he sees the subject, the indigenous person in the photograph and can step outside of the way it's building a kind of romantic idea of indigenous people. So Edward S. Curtis was one of these salvage ethnographers, entrepreneurs who really wanted to capture a dying culture in his own words. But as Jeff is one of the most <laughs> kindest, like most complex people, he didn't wanna tell that story. So he went through and went to see the original um, works by Curtis and many of them were never really published to the public. And so in this series, he chooses ones where he feels like you can see the subjectivity of the indigenous person um, in the photograph. And then he juxtaposes it with contemporary native folks um, that he could imagine, you know, this might be what happens before or after this photo is taken. Um, and again, the two photos on either side, there is a kind of stereotypical representation um, from today that continues um, either in a toy or in a monument. So I'm gonna come back to this. I want to speak about another work first. Sometimes things like they just come into my mind and I have to do it in a different order than when I did the slides. Um, so this work I saw uh, in Vancouver on the West Coast. This is the Vancouver Art Gallery. And this is Marianne Nicholson, Kwakwakiwak artist, and also a linguist. She studies her language. And this work was, is a projection on the outside of the building. And it was incredibly um, life-changing for me to see this work because I think that she really, really, really captures the way in which Indigenous people, when they walk into a museum, they have many, many times, it's a chronotope, they have more times and spaces inside them than the present. Um, I have to give you a bit of history before I walk into what this work means. Um, so if we fast forward 100 years, in the 1980s, the repatriation movement has begun and the focus on cultural differences within museums comes to the fore. Many individual culture and community workers um, in North America were already working to change the attitudes of um, people inside museums from the very beginning of what we call the culture ban. It's important to remember that First Nations ceremonies and cultural practices were effectively made illegal in 1880 amendments to the 1876 Indian Act which was not repealed until 1951. So it's a long period. The law was as follows. Every Indian or other person who engages in or assists in celebrating the Indian festival known as the potlatch or in the Indian dance known as the tamanawanas is guilty of a misdemeanor, which really is the sun dance, um, shall be liable to imprisonment and any Indian or other persons who encourages an Indian or Indians to get up 
such a festival or dance or to celebrate the same is guilty of a like offense. Like most laws against First Nations, political, legal, social, and cultural sovereignty, they were liberally applied to almost all practices across the country. These histories of legislation, protest, resistance, and museums are deeply entwined, and it's, it's important to think about them together. So for example, one of Marianne Nicholson's um, ancestors, Dan Kramer, held a potlatch on December 25th in 1921 and was promptly arrested by the RCMP along with 40 other participants. All of the masks, regalia and other sacred belongings were confiscated and found their way into museum collections. This is a direct benefit to museums from the criminalizations of First Nations culture. In 2008, uh, Marianne Nicholson um, drew attention to the fact that the Vancouver Art Gallery used to be a courthouse, a court where her people were sent to jail for practicing their governance systems like the Dan Kramer potlatch. Nicholson created a 30 foot wide site specific projection on the front of the museum that effectively turned it into a traditional Kwakwakiwak ceremonial house. The work was aptly titled The House of Ghosts. First Nations artists cannot ignore these histories when we work with, in, and get purchased by institutions, which is why working with contemporary artists is key to creating major change. And then this is the most widely known artist in the world <laughs> that's Indigenous, which is Norval Morisot. I wanted to show these photographs because this is him up in Northern Ontario, you know, in his cabin painting. And this is how he began and um, before he became such an international success. And it, it was an anthropologist, ethnographer who, who so-called discovered him. <laughs> um, so you can see Selwyn Dudney. Um, who was doing a lot of research on um, Anishinaabe, more so as Anishinaabe, same nation as me. Uh, he was doing research on rock paintings and uh, that led him into Morso's territory and that's actually how they met. And what Morso does is he's taking kind of really old indigenous history and spiritual traditions um, and the visuality of those those rock paintings and they're also done on birch bark. Um, they contain our histories, our ceremonies and our songs. And he takes them and he starts put, putting them in paint and putting them into the art world. And at first it was quite, um, it was quite uh, controversial and elders were kind of really upset. And the reason they were upset because they've been going through this culture ban. So they lived through the criminalization of our culture. And they really worried about sharing it, sharing it outside because they had to hide these scrolls. They had to protect them. They had to try to hide these rock paintings from non-native people. Um, so their fear was really genuine and came from experience, but he persisted. And eventually um, people really felt that something had changed and that if, if Morriso could do so well, then maybe his work could serve to bring the next generation of indigenous folks um, back to the culture and back to the art. So um, Tom Hill, who I mentioned earlier, um, was instrumental in Morisot's career. He did uh, the exhibition at um, the Art Gallery of Ontario. Norval Morisot and the Emergence of the Image Makers co-curated with Elizabeth McLuhan, um, a non-native English Canadian. The exhibition demonstrated the development of the works of Morisot and how he'd influenced a whole another generation of what people refer to as the Woodland School. Um, in his catalog essay, Hill charts the shifts in Indian, quote, art from the sacred and everyday to the commercial, the tourist, and finally to the engagement with European forms and functions. This is not a linear history with all these facets existing at the same time and continuing today. He describes in detail the relationship between a growing indigenous voice demanding to run their own affairs and an increasing independent indigenous art from artists trained in art schools 
marrying Western and traditional imageries and ideas. The exhibition was fitting um, also because the AGO had added a work by Norvell Morso to the collection of contemporary art in 1979, which is really early um, and it's a rare moment of foresight uh, on the part of a museum. Just to give you a bit of a detail, this work is called Man Changing into Thunderbird and um, his spirit name is Copper Thunderbird. It's a really kind of personal piece. And the Thunderbirds are the ones who travel between the spirit world and the uh, secular world, a human world, the animal world. Um, and they, they communicate between, um, they are also kind of the directly related to the health of the earth, mother earth. Um, this is another important moment in 1978, Daphne Ojik's Indian in Transition. So the Canadian Museum of Man, which is now the Canadian Museum of History. Um, oh, sorry. Now the Canadian Museum of History commissioned Daphne to do this work. And she wanted to, in paint, show the resilience, the cultural resilience, the cultural resurgence and the beauty of community um, of her people as we transitioned from um, a really dark period of residential schools. So all of our children were taken, put into residential schools, taken from their communities, held in like what I would call like jail, um, beaten for speaking their languages, um, had their cultures um, denigrated as evil, their languages speaking the tongue of Satan. And you have 150 years of that. You have, you know, about 100 years of the culture ban. And then you have everyone coming back out and finding their way back to their communities, finding their way back to their languages, finding their way back to their cultures. Many, many people were, were so strong and they held on to them while they went through residential school. And she sees um, this moment, this cultural resurgence moment, um, beautifully painted in this work. But Daphne is another figure that's really important because in 1971, um, a group of eight artists gathered in her uh, new store um, in Winnipeg to discuss the suffocation of their artistic output by the anthropological and ethnographic lens. So Jackson Beardy, Eddie Cobanes, Alex Janvier, and Carl Ray and Joseph Sanchez, along with uh, Norval Morriso, they form the core member of this group called Professional Native Artists Inc. Javi says that Bill Reed was part of it, um, but he never showed up to meetings. <laughs> so they, they, call, um, they call themselves the Indian Group of Seven um, if they leave out Bill Reed. Um, the Professional Native Artists Inc. believed that their paintings and sculptures belonged in art galleries and needed that context to be understood as art. In 1974, Ojig opened the new warehouse gallery where they held their inaugural exhibition, which featured more than 200 works. Together, these artists pushed doors of the art world open to work that was about their contemporary realities, which included stories, visual culture, and ceremonies of their ancestors. The group were also integral for um, starting a series of native art conferences. And so this discussion with, from indigenous folks with indigenous folks about art began at this time as well. I'm showing you this. It's a, it's a Anishinaabe pattern for a weaving, a basket weaving um, to show you another form of art that's happening at the same time. So this is Robert Hool Red is Beautiful, done in 1970. It's the first work of his bought by a museum and it was bought by the Canadian Museum of Man. So again, there's, there's conflict here. Um, as artists are making work and it's being purchased and shown, it's largely being shown in historical museums. And so that's why Daphne and them are trying to push their way into the contemporary art scene and into um, fine arts museums. But at the same time, um, Robert Hool ends up being part of a history of, of changing, bringing contemporary art museum, bringing contemporary art into the historical museum as well. So here's Robert's um, engagement with the modern art and also his inspiration comes from the abstraction 
and the indigenous legacy, the aesthetics of indigenous work, um, that is the oldest art in our land and the way he's bringing these two things together. So this is a par flesh, which would have been shown in a museum um, as a representation of say Crow, Crow culture or kind of a generic indigenous culture. Um, Robert looks to these as the spiritual legacy of the ancient ones. So he looks to them as a legacy, as our heritage, um, and then proceeds to start making his own parfleshes and in oil. And you'll see, you, I don't know if you can notice, but there are these tiny porcupine quills that are piercing the canvas. Um, and this is a, a key moment thinking about how do contemporary artists sort of look at their own past? How do they carry it forward? Um, and also to think about modernism as this purity that he is kind of infecting with um, indigenous material. So this is part, that was one of Parfleshes for the Last Supper. And here he's really, um, Robert Houle also went to residential school for his elementary years and high school years. And here he um, is kind of grappling with the Parfleshes for the Last Supper, um, grappling with the Catholicism he was raised with. And also he was raised in the Sundance and in his traditional um, ceremonies. And so as, a, as, a, as an artist, these things are starting to come together in his work. This is Mimeland. This is Shelley Nero, um, 1992, 500 year itch. Shelley Nero is Haudenosaunee, also from Six Nations, but she was born in New York. Um, this is a, a series of 12 triptychs. I'm only showing you one. Um, and it's, it's uh, here she is dressed as Marilyn Monroe in one panel, but, uh, and it's Marilyn Monroe from the Seven Year Itch. That's the play on the title. Uh, and she has a fan under instead of a subway grate. And she also has her uh, glasses on and it, it's quite, she's smiling. Um, she's overturned um, the fan. And in the middle is a photograph of her mother and it's done in sepia tone to sort of give a sense of pastness. And then on the far corner, it's like Shelley Nero as herself today in black and white. And she sort of sees these as um, the three times that sort of form her contemporary worldview. She has to grapple with the representations given in popular media for who she is as a woman. She's also got the beautiful history of her mother and their, their relationship. And then she has how she sees things as an artist today. And of course, her mother becomes a model for her in thinking about um, the future. Oops. And I just want to say 500 year itch, 1992. I mean, that was the year of the, everybody was celebrating Columbus's landing on in North and South America. Um, and indigenous artists fought really hard and worked really hard to change that discourse to be talking about 500 years of colonization. So it's a, it's a year when indigenous art is almost everywhere. And there is a huge conversation about how do indigenous people see this history? What has been the experience of colonization? And so there's a lot of museums doing exhibitions all the way across the country. And a lot of people are making work. Um, and here's another one. Uh, this was curated by Robert Houle and uh, two other curators, uh, non-native curators. And it's called Land Spirit Power, also in 1992. It's the first major exhibition of contemporary indigenous art at the National Gallery of Canada. So it's a big, big deal. And in 1977, prior to this, Robert had been hired as the first curator of Indigenous art at the Museum of Man, which today is the Canadian Museum of History. And these two museums, the National Gallery and the History Museum are right across the river from each other. So there's an interesting relationship there. And it was widely publicized when he quit his position because he saw that, um, this sacred bundle that had been entrusted to the museum um, and part of its 
part of the trust that was given to the museum is that they would never open it um, because as a sacred bundle, it, it has a spirit, it's a living thing. Um, and he saw that people were doing scientific kind of conservation tests on it. So he quit um, and brought a lot of attention to the way museums treat um, our belongings and our spiritual legacy as objects, artifacts, dead things, when really they are living. Um, so Land Spirit Power was a major exhibition um, that changed the way people see Indigenous art and also Indigenous people and the history of the country. And um, the second part of the title is First Nations Art at the Art Gal National Gallery of Canada. It's, it's a, it had a range of works from video to installation to carvings by 18 Indigenous artists. The other curators, Townsend Gull and Nemiroff, in their catalog essays argue um, its relationship to postmodernism and the question of cultural difference. So allowing postmodernism to open the door of museums to contemporary indigenous art as a kind of spectacle of cultural difference. Um, all of the curatorial statements frame tradition as something that is always changing. There's a desire not to repeat the mistake of relegating authentic culture to pre-contact past. And um, this is a work by Robert Houle done in the same year um, that was purchased by the National Gallery of Canada um, called Canada. So it really addresses the history of Canada. And what he did was take a Benjamin, a much beloved Benjamin West painting called The Death of General Wolfe and he strips the scene of color and places the emphasis on the native figure in that original painting. And then he flanks it with his uh, color fields in or his abstractions on either side in blue and red, which actually are also Britain and France. And then the whole piece forms the feeling of a flag. And here you can see a bit Sorry, it's not a great photo, but a bit of um, a dive into it. So this figure um, was a Delaware man who was not pre present at the death of General Wolf. None of these figures were present at the death of General Wolf. And actually people would pay, paid Benjamin West to be placed in this painting. So when you think about how a painting becomes um, a major part of a national history, and then you find out that that history is not accurate, not, not real. Um, you have to kind of start asking yourself, okay, so what is this narrative saying? And you have this native figure who's kind of contemplating what has happened. Um, and when you focus on him, I think you get centered on what has happened to indigenous people. They were allies in these wars. They were um, definitely in a relationship of negotiation treaty relationships, all of this is going on at this time, but wasn't present in the original painting until Robert revisits it. And then he revisited that work again, um, most recently in 2017. This is Owen de Mauwen, we were told. And here he's taking an even further step to thinking about what that continuity is between all of our ancestors and ourselves today. And if what this land would have been like if it had been left alone, um, if indigenous people didn't have to go through uh, colonization. Or I also ask myself, what if the first contact that did respect indigenous ways of being and philosophies and negotiations and governance systems, what if we'd continued on that path instead of um, reneging on those agreements and um, going through this kind of violent uh, cultural genocide. I need to check the time. I'm sorry, I don't have a clock in front of me. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. And um, I don't think we have a lot of time for questions. Sorry about that, but I'm going to uh, open it up anyway. I think we have a little bit of time. I see that we have 
Uh, how do you see the representation of Indigenous artists in Canadian museums in terms of quantity? Okay. Uh, the quantity is growing, but slowly. Um, it does require, um, one thing I've noticed at the, in the work that I'm doing, it requires that collectors and donors and um, people who give us funding to buy work also have to see it as valuable. And so we've been doing a lot of work on that regard to um, kind of change people's uh, collecting priorities and for them to think about uh, collecting Indigenous art. Um, is there an Indigenous group of seven? Um, yes, that's what I talked about. The, uh, the Professional Native Artists Inc. was their name for themselves, but they were dumb, dubbed the Indian Group of Seven. Um, they were a group of painters that started in the 60s, well, 50s actually, 50s, um, and worked all the way until now. Alex Janvier is still alive and still painting today. So they were the first kind of group that came out of the residential schools and um, started working with uh, acrylic, oil, drawing, and um, working between their culture and sort of Western uh, understandings of art. And I think that's all the questions I can see in the, in the chat. I would like to say thank you very much for listening today. And there's a lot to learn and a lot to think about. And um, this was just a tiny sampling of a couple of moments that I hope opened, um, opened the doors to further learning and exploration of Indigenous art. Thank you. Mm, we surely saw how rich this field is. And uh, I hope our visitors have become an idea to dive deeper into it when, when they make contact in a very different way. Thank you so much again, Wanda. Thank and you. Goodbye to everyone who listened in and see you again, hopefully in the exhibition or in another webinar soon to be communicated. Bye bye and have a great day or afternoon or evening here in Germany. Bye. Bye bye and thank you again. <laughs>